It's it's great to be with this uh, with this group and to talk about Dan Markey's excellent book, China's Western uh, Horizons. Uh, you know, the book raises some interesting questions that uh, actually predated uh, the, the the current state of confrontation between U.S. and China, but it definitely very much fits into into that mold. You know, for, for a very long time, the United States has thought of China only mattering to the Pacific. You know, we've seen it as a when we say Asia and China, we really mean Southeast Asia to, to uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And we sort of think of China essentially only being interested in the Pacific. That's very true, but at the same time, China is also a continental uh, uh, country that expands all the way to West Asia. In uh, uh, recent decades, uh, uh, even the some of its industrial centers and, and some of its population centers have been gradually moving to the West. And, and also it's become much more interested in West Asia also as an alternate route for supplies of energy and other minerals that could circumvent the Straits of Malacca, which is uh, you know, where it's right now getting most of its energy and commodity coming over the Indian Ocean, but it's a chokehold that the United States could potentially control. And as the relations between the two countries have become more conflictual, the Chinese obviously have tried to uh, put, you know, put their stake in the South China Sea. But, but at the same time, West, Western Asia and access points through Myanmar and then further West through Pakistan have become far more uh, important to it. This by and large had gone under the radar of the US uh, administration and foreign policy making. So even during the Obama period, when we talked about pivot to Asia, of saying that you know the, the, the future of the global order, global economy, wealth, prosperity is going to be decided uh, in, our, in our positioning vis-a-vis -vis China. Again, we were just thinking about the Pacific, whereas all along the Chinese had started to think westwards. I was reminded of uh, a, a phrase that Henry Kissinger once said. He said that the Europeans don't quite understand that they are, the, to, to China, they are the end point of Eurasia. And that sort of the Chinese are now looking sort of much more westward. And then when the Chinese established this idea of a, of a Belt and Road Initiative, a new Silk Road to um, a build uh, um, uh, re economic relations with varieties of countries from Africa through Asia, one of the very first places they invested in was Pakistan, where they, with, with, which uh, Dan very well covers in his book. This, this idea of, of building a, a, a relationship with Pakistan that would include investment in infrastructure, uh, building of markets, uh, uh, building a major port facility on the, on the Arabian Sea, the port of uh, Guaido. Now, you know, come in the Trump administration, focus shifts to a, a much more heated rivalry between the United States and China and also issues of trade. Uh, cyber issues, technology issues, but but again, most things are focused on again on the on the Asia Pacific. Meanwhile, I think the Chinese uh, have now sort of begun to look to the Middle East as the next step beyond Pakistan. Uh, we have always thought about China as only be inter being interested in the Middle East for two purposes: one, as a major source of its energy. For instance, even during the two thousands. Saudi Arabia was China's largest energy supplier, and China was Saudi Arabia's largest energy customer. So even the, this myth of American dependence on Saudi oil, uh, even a decade, two decades ago, was already replaced by China being uh, the, the biggest customer for Saudi oil and vice versa, Saudi Arabia being heavily dependent on the Chinese market. On the back of this came the idea of, of, of the Chinese in use, investing in the region. As there are markets where Chinese capital could see benefits in developing projects that then would be beneficial uh, uh, to, to the Chinese economy. And then ultimately, whether there are, there are markets or other commodities that China could, could benefit from. 
and and we all but but we always assume that China's interest in the Middle East is purely commercial. It does not have a security dimension. The Chinese may benefit of American security umbrella, but they're not going to get involved in Arab-Israeli issue, or they're not going to get in the middle of an Iranian uh, Saudi uh, rivalry. We're at the point where this might be changing. Uh, for, for a number of reasons. So one is that we're seeing a China that is very different from the China of your grandfather, let's say, uh, in the sense that uh, you know many observers still, when they talk about China, they have the model of, uh, of the 1989 to let's say 2019 China in mind. The China that wants to keep its head low, uh, is only interested in business, is trying to stay at the right side of things. But we're also seeing a China that is much more aggressive in terms of nationalism and, and, and other sets of things that it wants to see. And therefore, it, it may very well start to play a different role in the Middle East. We already have seen uh, naval exercises between the Chinese Navy and the Iranian Navy, which would not have been done in the past, or the Chinese helping Saudi Arabia develop nuclear capability, which, which is not a purely commercial activity. It's, it's, it's an investment in Saudi Arabia that has security implication and could run afoul of the United States in ways that, that, that China has not calculated before. Secondly, uh, the United States has effectively been leaving the Middle East. It's leaving a vacuum behind. And the Chinese, even if they had previously expected that they could take advantage of an American security umbrella, that the US Navy will police the Persian Gulf and the United States will send troops to Afghanistan, will send troops to different places and do all the fighting while Chinese do the business is no longer uh, holding up. So the Chinese ought to be thinking over the horizon about how are they going to protect their own oil supplies? How are they going to prevent Iran and Saudi Arabia from going to war or Iranians attacking Saudi oil facilities, for instance? And that, you know, the Chinese don't play checkers, they play chess. They look at 25, year, 25 years rather than at two and a half years or, 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 a or the next business quarter. So for them, the idea that the United States is getting exhausted, that there's not bipartisan support in the United States for a much smaller footprint in the region uh, is suggestive that, that they, they, they have to, whether they like it or not, become much more involved in the region. And then the third issue is that uh, the, 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 there are parts of the Middle East that are also now looking to China. So, I mean, for, we know Saudi Arabia or UAE or Israel look to China for business, for technology and the like, but countries like Iran have been looking to China in a very different way. They've been looking at China strategically. So there's been some time, almost two decades, that Iranians and the Chinese talk to each other about what is their mutual interest. And this mutual interest has begun to look more like one another during the Trump period. So, you know, historically, the Chinese see themselves as a wounded civilization that was wronged by colonial West. Iranians see themselves in the same manner. I, I was once told that every conversation uh, between the Chinese and the Iranians starts with a, with a half an hour discussion of, 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 the, of the opium wars and the Boxer Rebellion in China and the coup of 1953 and the 19th century uh, in Iran. Uh, and then, you know, increasingly, the two see the United States and the United States-backed regional order. I'm not talking about necessarily the international liberal order, but the regional order that is designed to contain them, that the United States is a limit to these great powers in their own minds being able to act as such in their own neighborhood. I mean, there's a term the Russians created, the near abroad which Putin very well says that this is my neighborhood, you get out of it and, and NATO shouldn't be there and, and everybody who's in my neighborhood should be, be kowtowing to the Kremlin. The Chinese now have this view that this is the middle kingdom. You know, the various countries of Asia pay tribute to, 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 to Beijing and the United States is, is getting the middle of that. The Iranians also sense that, you know, they're a great civilization, they're a great country and the United States is basically sitting in the Persian Gulf, is sitting in Iraq, is sitting in Afghanistan, is blocking Iran's ability to act as a regional great power. Now, during the Trump era, you know, for Iran, this was always a problem with, with in, in its relations with America. Now with, with the Chinese, uh, uh, this is now becoming increasingly the case. Now, whether it was TTP under Obama, that's the trade and trans-Pacific uh, uh, trade, uh, um, uh, 
deal that, that ultimately was scuttled, or now it is um, essentially trying to downsize China. So there's, and, and then, you know, is the issue of sanctions. Iran is a heavily sanctioned country. China's beginning to taste what American dollar power can do. So we don't like Huawei, you know, the, the 5G technology company. We could sanction any telecommunication company that buys it. We don't like this about China, we can sanction them. We can, we can arrest the CEO of Huawei for having done trade with Iran. We can punish countries uh, or companies that do certain businesses with China. And there's not much that the Chinese can do about it. So, so now they're also seeing a common, common cause with Iran around this sanctions issue. So, so the area of strategic understanding between the two countries has expanded. The Iranians clearly see China as a strategic alternative to the United States and Europe. Not that Chinese will do everything that Europe and the United States can do for Iran, but it is at least a source of a lot of manufacturing, a lot of commodities, a lot of goods, but also you can rely on China at the, at the Security Council in the United Nations to veto the US, or you could basically uh, uh, look to China as a, as a big power that at least is not following America's lead the way Germany or UK are. And for the Chinese, Iran is ultimately a sort of a smaller deflecting force vis-a-vis -vis the United States. That, that it, it, it sort of helps spread some of the pressure that the Chinese are feeling uh, with, with Iran. And, and as a result of this, the sort of a strategic common ground between them has been growing. I don't mean that to say that they are aligned together or that the Chinese agree with all of Iran's policies or that Iran is ready to listen to China on everything. But they are, they are basically seeing some kind of a ground that they should create a common front against the United States. Now that common front happens to also expand China's reach into the Middle East because Iran is a country of 80 million. It is strategically located right in the crossroads of Europe, Middle East, Asia, Central Asia, and South Asia. So it's, it's very well positioned. It's a, it's a wealthy country in energy, in minerals. It has a massive market, it has an educated population. It has all of those things, and it's not also a property of the United States, like, let's say, Saudi Arabia or many Arab countries are in terms of very tight alliance. And then also that there are there are also financial opportunities. So, so you know, investing in a country of 80 million, you know, could give China, the Chinese economy a, a sort of a ability to expand its markets into Iran, tap into Iran's energy resources build a railway network that could go all the way from Pakistan into Turkey and onto Europe, build pipelines into Central Asia. In other words, it can allow a sort of a network of, of, of access to West Asia and Europe through this landmass of Iran that would benefit the Chinese. And also tells us that really China is looking much more westward than, than we have uh, understood. So if you look in the rear, ver rear view mirror, you see one China. China that was focused on the East was all about business, kept its head low, did not you know, build strategic alliances. If you sort of imagine where China is going, you would see a very different China, a China that is willing to do these things and has, has now looking at the Middle East uh, as, as a, basically the new frontier for China's uh, 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 both political and economic influence to expand. Now, having said that, uh, uh, Iran, Iran is not sort of, does not have a monopoly on Beijing. I mean, the Chinese still are buying oil from Saudi Arabia. They still wanna have that relationship with the Arab world. They understand that the Arab world is also 200 million uh, people and that's a source of great energy. And they, they, they obviously would wanna follow a policy that unlike the United States, it's not binary. It's not either this or that. It's not black or white. But, that they, that, but in a typical Chinese way, they want to have relations with both sides. Can they sustain it? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tough question for them. It may not work that way, uh, but that's a big question to discuss. The second issue is that clearly this will not stop with Iran. So let's say they come into Iran, where do they go next after Iran? Turkey would be an obvious case. Another country that has run afoul of the West is beginning to look East and, uh, and, and therefore um, uh, would be open to similar kind of a relationship with China. Now the Chinese can't easily get to Turkey 
without having a sort of the transport routes through Iran. So Iran is really also a stepping stone towards Turkey. Now, you know, there are a couple of questions that come up, which are good, good topics for discussion. So one is the issue of, you know, how will, how will this uh, Chinese presence in the Middle East play into US-China relations? Does the US-China relations sort of uh, play out in the Middle East? I mean, kind of, can this become a battleground in which US, US and China can compete? I can tell you the Iranians certainly hope so. They think, you know, President Trump could bully them a lot more because they were not, they didn't have a strategic partnership with China. If they have a strategic partnership with China, the US may be much more considerate than it's been. Now, on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, would, would the Chinese sort of play a particular hand in the Middle East or the Americans another hand? Do we see some of what's unfolded in East Asia begin to unfold uh, in the Middle East? So that's a, that's a good question. And, and it, for the United States, it's a complete new way of thinking. You know, in the State Department, the division that works in the Middle East never speaks to the division that works in China. And now they have to talk to each other. Now these are not separate domains. In reality, now you have kind of a Venn diagram of China and the Middle East uh, going over one another. Now, this is one issue that it's interesting to, to think about and discuss. The, the other issue is, is the issue of China's uh, uh, Muslim minority. Now, not all China, I mean, there are Chinese, Muslim minorities in China are of different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, some of the most proper, prosperous, well integrated into China are Han Muslim Chinese which are sort of ethnically Chinese, but they happen to be Muslim. They, you can find them in Shanghai, you can find them in Beijing. Their roots go back to, uh, you know, two, three centuries after the, after the rise, of, uh, rise of Islam. Uh, it's a very old community. Uh, and it's not the one that is, that is in rebellion against the Chinese government. But we, we hear a lot about the Uyghur community, which is territorially, uh, uh, has, has a space, you know, has, has, has a territory that, of Xinjiang on Western China. Ethnically, they're not Chinese, they're Turkic people. They're much closer to the populations of, of Central Asia than they are to the Chinese. And they have been pursuing a, a, a separatist, uh, you know, political agenda. And, and there are elements of radicals among them who have been trained in, you know, in, in camps in Northwest Pakistan, in Afghanistan, et cetera. Now the Chinese have taken a very drastic policy of putting millions of them in, in, in re-education camps of trying to sever their ties with their religion, uh, teach them new religion. It is, it is a serious uh, uh, you know, human rights issue. And it, it puts a lot of the countries in the Middle East and South Asia in a pickle. So you know, the Turks were the only ones for a while who were complaining about Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs, but they've gone silent recently. Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, you know, none of them want to make it an issue. They're, they're basically uh, trying to sidestep the issue completely. But the question is, you know, at what point may this become a problem for China? Can you, can you really play a big role in a region that's predominantly Muslim uh, when you are suppressing a major Muslim minority and how long can you do it? And is that a mitigating uh, factor? So why don't I stop here? I'd be happy to, uh, you know, hear your comments or answer any questions you have. I mean, Turkey was the only one that actually publicly uh, criticized China for its handling of Uyghurs, but it's gone silent on that issue. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, none of them actually want to address this issue. And so uh, uh, for now, at least, it, it is not, it's, it's, it's mostly an, an issue in human rights circles in the West, but it's not necessarily resonating on the ground. That may change. I mean, you know, just because there's no noise now does not mean there might not be going forward. But, but also I would say that, you know, in an environment of, uh, that we're in, that the more the US champions this, the more, uh, you know, these governments and the Chinese government will claim that this is not a real issue, it's an American disinformation project. 
And, and so uh, uh, the U.S. is sort of in a bind. It cannot be the promoter of this issue unless the Muslims themselves do it. So I would say, you know, there the, are the couple of problems with that. One is that the, the, the Chinese really do not have the, the diplomatic infrastructure for, do, for doing that. The Russians are much better at it. You know, they, they, they going back to the Soviet era, they, they can convene people. They don't have the, America's convening power, but we've seen them that they can, they can bring different parts together. The Chinese are unpracticed in this kind of global diplomacy. They have been so silent, so much on the sidelines that it's very difficult to see sort of the Chinese being the convener of a, of a Saudi-Iranian negotiations, uh, let's say on Yemen. Secondly, is that, the, is that the Chinese cannot really step up so long as the US is basically following a particular policy of encouraging Iran and Saudi Arabia not to talk or encouraging the Saudi Arabia to fight. But imagine a world in which the United States was not involved. I think China's instinct is to have these two sides work together. Because if you're doing business north of the Persian Gulf and you're doing business south of the Persian Gulf, then you know, your interests lie in these two sides not fighting and not shooting at tankers that ultimately will be either carrying oil to your shores or, or are carrying goods to the Iranian ports. And, and I would say, but, but the problem is that the US for the past two or three decades has completely dominated the discourse in the region. So we'll see if as, as the US sort of becomes less of a force and as the Chinese influence will grow, my sense is that the Chinese have a vested interest in, in Iran and Saudi Arabia having better relations, not necessarily complete peace, but, but let, let's say have, have much more working relations and the Persian Gulf not be on a near war situation all the time. At one level, you could have a long-term vision, but also long-term consists of many short terms. And, and right now, uh, in, in the immediate time period, COVID itself, by definition, will be a short-term crisis. I mean, people say two years, three years after that, this particular pandemic might be over. So, so it's not something that is like we're thinking of, of having a COVID crisis for a decade. I think for now, it's provided the Chinese with a number of benefits. One is that the, the economic hit and the political hit to the United States means that the U.S.'s sort of global attention uh, in Middle East, in East Asia, is, is likely to be less. Yes, it'll be focused on China, but, but very clearly uh, this crisis will take a toll on, 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 on U.S. presence in the region. Uh, secondly, um, the Chinese have uh, taken advantage of basically providing uh, a PPE, providing assistance, providing know-how, providing medicine, uh, uh, economic aid when the United States was unable or unwilling to do so. And you know the, the Trump administration has been singularly disinterested in South Asia, in the Middle East, unless it has been Saudi Arabia or UAE or Israel. So, you know, the Chinese have bought a lot of goodwill by basically stepping up, you know, the provision of, of these sorts of things. Now, doesn't mean that they've bought the entire populations, everybody's happy, or there are no questions about China's role in the COVID itself, but, but it has provided assistance when the US hasn't. And, and thirdly, and I think more importantly, you know, the Chinese are gaining huge amount of benefit from basically arguing that they have a superior form of government to the United States uh, at two levels. One is that uh, they have managed this uh, crisis from start to finish in a short time period, relatively cost-free, and their main international nemesis, the United States, can get out of its own way. We can have a policy on on masks, uh, and 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 uh, some of this is federal, some of it's it's constitutional in the U.S., but. You know, their argument to the people of the region is stop looking to the West as a model. They're not a model, we're the model. And it's actually having traction. And then the second part and connected is that President Trump has really made a hash of democracy in America. And, and that, that sort of feeds onto this. So, you know, again, you know, this is the United States that has lectured us about democracy and talks about all of these things and, and look at the United States itself. Uh, it cannot defend its own borders against disinformation. It cannot manage a crisis. It's, it's completely 
sort of uh, 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 coming apart at, at, at critical junctures. And you're seeing traction of that. So whether it's in the behavior of the Revolutionary Guards in Iran or the ruling family in Saudi Arabia or the presidency in Turkey, this, there, there is much more respect and copying of the Chinese model now than it is of the American model. I mean, at the high level, this idea of authoritarianism plus economic growth is much more of the East Asia Chinese model, the, the idea of, 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 a, of control of society. Even China's social controls of, of, uh, of uh, surveilling their populations, of limiting Twitter and, 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 and Facebook, and the fact that the United States hasn't been doing much about it uh, is basically now others are copying it. So, uh, so in a way, uh, the, the, the Chinese have, have gained, made, made great strides in terms of, and actually this is an argument they make to their own population, which relieves some of the pressure that we thought that, that the population would be under. In other words, if you have any questions about democracy or good government, please look at the United States. I think there's no one size fits all. It depends on how countries negotiate, what are they negotiating for, and what are the ter terms of the agreement. Yes, there's a lot of griping about that, that the Chinese terms for loans might be not favorable to the borrower, or the Chinese are basically exporting their own capital. But but beggars would can be choosers. I mean, if countries literally need these things and they can't get it from the West, they can't raise the money. And the Chinese are willing and to come and build this railway or build this building or build this bridge, and these are the terms. You know, you can take it or you could you could leave it. I mean, the United States constantly says that this is bad for the countries that are borrowing this money, but it actually has no alternative on the table. Uh, there's no there's no comparable Western money. Countries are not choosing between America financing a rapid rail system or the Chinese financing rapid rail system. So often these things come down to you know, you 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 either have a right, get get this from the Chinese at whatever terms you negotiate, or you don't get it at all. And I think increasingly countries are that are 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 seeing that China is basically the only option. Now it is up to countries to to not waste this opportunity. So I mean, if money goes to corruption, or you know, they get they get some infrastructure, but they don't build on it, uh, they're going to end up with debt. Let's say uh, at at the end of the game. Now, you know, for countries, uh, uh, the way they think about this is that they get some financial relief, they get uh, some infrastructure, and then they get sort of uh, uh, woven into a, a, a network of trade that will benefit them. Let's say if there is peace in Afghanistan and the Chinese come and say, we're willing to build the roads and the railways and the airports, and yes, it would cost you, but then the Afghans would think, okay, that will tie us into some kind of an export import network that you could back actually stand up your economy. So in that case, it's good for, for Afghanistan. Now, why are the Chinese doing this? The Chinese are basically trying to integrate larger parts of the world into their own market so that they can transport and, and, and excavate commodities and then export final products and sell them. They have a lot of money and they have also a lot of excess capacity in their industries and they have excess labor in some places. They wanna put that money, equipment and labor to work. So they send them to Ethiopia or they send them to Pakistan to do all of this work. This benefits them. But the benefit to the countries is certain degree of economic relief, it's certain degree of infrastructure development. And then ultimately it would be whether they can actually get uh, sort of a, a sustainable economic relationship uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with China. So uh, I think the devil is in the details and it's very difficult for the US to argue against this without having an alternate development model on the table. Thank you.